Tonight, our speaker is Renee, whom you all know. Um, she's speaking on awakening divine essence and liberating the potential within. So Renee is a dedicated student of the ancient wisdom and has been active in the society in various capacities over many years. And most of you will know her because we spent lots of time visiting your branches and she's been the main person coordinating all our events over the last well, many years now, seven years. She is currently the National Vice President of the New Zealand section. And Renee has also coordinated the Theosophical Order of Service in New Zealand for 19 years, nurturing many projects through this avenue of service. In fact, she's the one who restarted the TOS in New Zealand 19 years ago, and it's going really well. Her key focus and passion is applying the ancient wisdom teachings in her own life and, enthusiastic, and enthusiastically encourages others to do the same. So I'll now happily pass it over to Renee. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's talk. All right, so our title tonight, Awakening Divine Essence, Liberating the Potential Within. So one of the most famous mystic poets of Iran, Attar of Nishapur, his works were the inspiration of many Persian poets and Attar, he was one of the two, along with Sinai, who were two of the greatest influences on Rumi and Rumi's Sufi views. He was very broad, he was very beautiful and very universal. And I'd like to start with a quote from him. The heart is the dwelling place of that which is the essence of the universe. If you draw aside the veils of the stars and the spheres, you will see that all is one with the essence of your own pure soul. And Helena Blavatsky, the heart is the organ of spiritual consciousness. So there's nothing like diving in straight to where we're going to the heart. And our title, Awakening Divine Essence, Liberating the Potential Within. I hope the title itself elicits some questions for you. Do you see or recognize part of yourself as divine or divine essence of your own pure soul? It is suggested that this is liberated so that we are an integrated being, a whole being. An interesting um, thing to consider as we often only identify with maybe the physical side, maybe emotions, mental, and the spiritual side of ourselves is it often doesn't even get a look in. But many will have the experience of meditation, contemplation, silence, nature. And sometimes we only have a little of those experiences, but we do have that experience of spirit if we've ever slowed down and uh, taken some time for that. What it actually brings up for me is who am I? Who are you? And the ancient Greek aphorism is very helpful for, for us. Noskate ipsum, or know thyself, is one of the Delphic maxims and was the first of three inscribed in the forecourt of the Temple of Apollo at Delphi. This inscription is above the entrance to the shrine of the Delphic Oracle. Early ancient Greeks say the phrase meant, know thy measure. For interest's sake, I thought I'd just jot down the other two maxims. Um, the second one is nothing to excess, which reminds me of the um, Buddha's middle, middle way, no excesses. And thirdly, Certainty brings insanity. So that's an interesting one. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. 
So the phrase itself, know thyself, has been attributed to many Greek sages, including Aeschylus, Pythagoras, and Plato, amongst others. It seemed to be a very common proverb back then in those times. So a little bit like now, what's very common that we hear now of one of our proverbs is being aware to, um, we talk of awareness and being awake to things. And that's something that's very common now. But back then in Greek, those Greek times, everyone was speaking of know thyself. And to Socrates, he said, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. Now attributed to the oracle at Delphi are these words. Heed these words, you wish to probe the depths of nature. If you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself and you will know the universe and the gods. So before you can enter the sacred temple or the Holy of Holies, we must discover this for ourselves within our own heart. There is a very ancient axiom, which many of you will have heard of. And this one is very helpful to meditate upon. And I'm sure many of you have, because it expresses the universality of the basic unity of life with great clarity and precision. As it is in the great, so it is in the small. As it is above, so it is below. As it is within, so is the without. There is but one life and one law. And it continues by emphasizing the essential unity of all. There is neither great nor small. There is neither above nor below. There is neither within nor without in the divine economy. It is said that meditate upon this will open your eyes to many truths. In practicing this, try and discover the correspondences between the pairs of opposites, the above and the below, the within and the without, the great and the small, light and darkness, good and evil. I mean, there's so many of the pairs of opposites, all in our world with which we live. Easy to see, I think, most of these in these times that we're living at the moment. So it can bring you to see the patterns and the um, constant rhythms and movements repeating themselves again and again, both in the universe and within our own lives. When you think of the sun and the planets revolving around the sun, the nucleus, the powerhouse, this is repeated within our own structure of the human body, that divine essence, divine spark of life, said to reside in the heart. Both have myriads of smaller systems within each. For example, the various systems, or you could even say the little lives within the human body, all the cells. In the universe, there appears an incredibly intricate web of relationships and manifestations of the one life. Cycles of creativity and dissolution, the constant ebb and flow of life. In the human being, the web of relationships between all the systems of the body, each of them connected. And when one's not working properly, there is a pressure on all others. And sometimes we know with different things, they can spread to the other organs. So we are all connected as well. We can apply these concepts to the realms of our whole being, the body, emotions, mind, and spirit. Now, I find Louise Hay quite helpful here. Um, I use some of her um, affirmations and things, but take her with a broad brush, but it's very helpful sometimes when you have an ailment and you're trying to get to 
what's behind that ailment, you can look up some of the emotional side of things. So these four areas that I've just spoken of, um, they all play a major importance in our lives so far as our health and general well-being are concerned in the human being. Now, can you imagine for a minute every form or aspect of ourself, dense or, or subtle, all parts of our being, coming into existence by the pressures of inner growth? Imagine keeping equilibrium between those four aspects with the pairs of opposites and then relate that to our own life patterns. Remembering it is only at the lower or more material dense levels of manifestation that these pressures are expressed in the many conflicts which cause disease, tragedy, and even evil that we see in the world. It is an imbalance of one type or another which causes this at the many levels of not just our being, but, but the one being of life. As individuals learning about life, you could say equilibrium and balance, non-reaction, non-judgment, working with nature and the great cosmic laws that ultimately they are working towards harmony in all areas of the human being. And that includes our divine aspect. We often pay great attention to the physical, to the emotions, the mental, but our spiritual aspect barely gets a look in often, maybe squeezed in when we have time, or we may be someone that lives constantly in our left brain. So we are rationalizing things all the time. We live in that area. Um, it's like a mental filter, or it could be that we are super emotional. And so we react constantly through the filter of emotions. All of these, all, or, all of this overcompensating in one area, eventually something pulls us up, pulls us back, and we have to find balance. It could be through illness or conflict within our lives. Now, the second part of our title, Liberating the Potential Within, suggests we are setting something free. That something, a potential or an unrealized aspect or ability within ourselves is to be set free. Now, in HPB's mystical book, The Voice of the Silence, she leaves us some clues. She says, before the soul can see, the harmony within must be attained and fleshly eyes be rendered blind to all illusion. Now, Helena Blavatsky, she speaks in the secret doctrine when she speaks about maya or illusion as an element that enters all finite things. So when we per perceive things from a lower aspect, and not from the big picture or the whole, there's only a relative and not an absolute reality to it. She says the same of truth. She says we can't find that ultimate truth here. She says we can only find relative truth and we have to make the best we can of that. So our understanding is tied to the power of our cognition and the depth of it. So understanding through our thought, our experience, and the senses, how deep is that understanding? The society's third object, to investigate unexplained laws of nature and the powers latent in the human being. Many think it is tied to the psychic powers, but it is quite clear in the teachings of theosophy that is not the psychic powers at all, but the powers of understanding within the human being, the powers of perception, the powers of seeing. Um, Helena Blavatsky, she left us uh, quite an interesting definition of spirituality. She said, it is the power of perceiving formless, 
spiritual essence. So attaining an awareness of this, attaining an awareness of seeing clearly um, this essence or this aspect of how we see. So how do we do this? Um, in the secret doctrine, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, on page 17 from memory, third fundamental proposition, um, she says, the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root and the obligatory pilgrimage for every soul, a spark of the former, through the cycle of necessity in accordance with cyclic and karmic law during the whole term. The third proposition is very beautiful for us to contemplate upon and very applicable to us. There is a line particularly that I find quite magical within this fundamental proposition. It is the pivotal doctrine of the esoteric philosophy admits no privileges or special gifts in the human being, save those won by their own soul through personal effort and merit throughout a long series of metempsychoses and reincarnation. So she's pretty clear there, personal effort and merit throughout a long series of metempsychoses, which is awakenings, and reincarnations and reincarnation that's our mode of travel from life to life so it's it's up to us individually our personal effort and merit no one else can do this for us there's no special gifts it's our personal effort and merit so that brings me to practice so theosophy offers both an accurate and a detailed map of all that we are as an individual, the various aspects of our whole being. I'm not going to go into all of that tonight because you know, a lot of us have either read some of that or we understand that, but it's up to us to explore that territory that this map represents. And um, this practice though, that we're speaking of, it's our own experiential journey and not book theory. So I have an analogy here with some slides that I hope will make this clear. The books, they are the signposts to wisdom, not wisdom itself. I'm sure that guy there with all those books is a theosophist. Um, so not the wisdom itself. To that requires effort on our part and is experiential for each one of us. And if we just stay with the books, awakening this way, it could take a very long time. Now to the analogy. Are we going to keep reading the menu? That's the menu there. Well, it's an example of a menu for everyone. Or are we going to partake of a meal of theosophy? So I hope that analogy is helpful. As we rise in the scale of development, we perceive that during the stages through which we have passed, we mistook those shadows for reality. So we know sometimes when we have an aha moment, let's say we had one 20 years ago with something, we may have moved from that, our position of that. And it's the upward progress of the soul in a series of progressive awakenings. Each advance bringing with it the idea that now at last we have reached reality. Now that reminds me of that third maxim in the Greek temple, certainty brings insanity. So sometimes we get stuck on these things and we don't want to move. So there, there is no ultimate certainty when we land in position. It is constantly upward and onward. And that's what I absolutely admire about theosophy. There's no end to that upward and onward journey. The ancient wisdom or theosophical teachings have at their core principles and concepts of which are the foundation of the ancient wisdom itself. 
And aren't we wanting to find a state of consciousness that embodies these concepts and not just mentally knowing them in our brains? But if we are to grow in awareness and cultivate the divine wisdom within, we need to practice. This, of course, is not something new. Master Kutumi, one of the inner founders of the TS, explained, theosophy is no new ca candidate for the world's attention, but only the restatement of principles which have been recognized from the very infancy of humankind. So it's creating the time to practice these principles into our lives, to be still, to contemplate, and to allow space. Now, Sri Aur Aurobindo made that clear when he spoke of all kinds of discoveries are made when we, when the thinking machinery stops. If the power to think is a remarkable gift, the power not to think is even more so. Let the seeker try for just five minutes and they will see what stuff they are made of. Very beautiful quote, that one. Um, I'll just comment here before I move on that even if you're very, very busy in life, just taking that five minutes every day Let's say, and I wouldn't overdo it. If you too often say I'm going to do an hour every day and it's too much for you, you'll probably drop that hour. But if you do those five minutes and it's achievable and you stick to that, you will find after a period of time, a couple of months, that you will want to do more and you will find your practice will grow from there. So start small and move from there and make it achievable. Now, from the Christian tradition, a lot of people will know this, be still and know that I am God. Very beautiful one from the Bible. And I have seen um, quite a lot of um, Jeffrey Hodson books where he has written to someone and he has inscribed the book. And so many times I have seen there in his inscription, I, if I be lifted up, will lift all beings unto me. I think he uses the word, will lift all men, but we'd say beings now. So I will lift all beings unto me. Another very beautiful one and just tells you for you to do the work and then that lifts everybody. We are each unique and we each have a part to play. unfolding the potential within like a rose unfolding its petals to the sun. The potential within each human being, that unlimited growth. Imagine seeing everyone, seeing the divine in everyone. Yet ourselves, we need a mirror for ourselves so that what we project, we can see our own being, the measure of ourselves, the measure of thyself, doing what we came to do. Be who you are, authentic you. We each are unique. We seek connection and belonging usually everywhere else, I have to say. I, I, I know this one very well. We tend to seek it anywhere outside of ourselves. But eventually, when it gets tough enough, when there's nowhere else for us to turn, we go within our own hearts. We are all being. As we open our hearts, the recognition of the one life blossoms and this be our heart's desire. Change is in the hearts of people. That quote, that little last one, in the hearts of people is from Tim Boyd. Now, I also want to quote Thich Nhat Hanh. He passed not too long ago. He said, 
Freedom is not given to us by anyone. We have to cultivate it ourselves. It is a daily practice. So once again, he's pointing us towards that daily practice. He tried to leave us. Well, he left us with lots of clues, actually, Thich Nhat Hanh. Breath is the bridge which connects life to consciousness, which unites your body to your thoughts. Whenever your mind becomes scattered, use your breath as a means to take hold of your mind again. So one of the tools that we can use, we have right here, and we can use it any time. Now, before we only have a little bit more to do, uh, I thought we'd do a small meditation ourselves tonight. Um, and Jeffrey Hodson, he taught a meditation called A Yoga of Light to help us recall who we are. I'm using a modified version of that meditation from Shirley Nicholson's book, The Seven Human Powers, Luminous Shadows of the Self. Uh, the National Library definitely has that book. It's just a wonderful book. So maybe just get comfortable and then bring your attention to your breathing. Breathe in through the nose and out through the mouth. I will finish this meditation with, um, with a prayer. It's called the One Reality. I come to thee in the quiet of this evening hour, seeking union with thee and therefore with all others, seeking to realize that thou art seated equally in all beings and to see thee gaze at me from all eyes, to hear thee speak in all voices, seeking to manifest thy peace, thy wisdom, thy power, and view the world with love-filled eyes, to be gentle, understanding, wise, seeking to see thy children as thou seest them, and to manifest thee, so I, I may call thee forth in all thy beauty, in all whom I meet this day. So if you just quietly come back to the Zoom. So it's time for us to get on our bike and practice. Let's be true to our inmost being, that inner aspect of ourself, our whole being. Thought I'd just read a few things from HPB before we um, finish that you might find helpful. The divine spiritual I is alone eternal and the same throughout all births, whereas the personalities it informs in succession are evanescent, changing like the shadows of a kaleidoscope series of forms in a magic lantern. And theosophy is the shoreless ocean of universal truth, love and wisdom, reflecting its radiance on the earth. Theosophy is divine nature, visible and invisible. Theosophy is the fixed eternal sun. It is the quintessence of duty. That's from HPB's key to theosophy. And in 1879, so this was about 13 years before she um, 
she passed this plane, she said, to fully define theosophy, we must consider it under all its aspects. The interior world has not been hidden from all by impenetrable darkness, by that higher intuition acquired by theosophia or God knowledge, which carried the mind from the world of form into that of formless spirit. Human beings have sometimes enabled in every age and in every country to perceive things in their interior or invisible world. That's liberating something that can't be seen. Now, I do have some recommended readings, the, the various um, exercises and meditations and things that I drew upon were from some of these books here. So I've, I've left the books there so that you can jot them down or screenshot it, um, particularly the, the Shirley Nicholson one, The Seven Human Powers, just a superb book. And the other one that has lots of exercises that will help you is um, The Path of Healing by H.K. Chaloner. It's a really good one. And then, of course, I drew from H.P. Blavatsky's works, which The Key to Theosophy, The Secret Doctrine, which both of those, the works just come alive. They almost speak to you and jump off the page, is what I find with H.P. Blavatsky. Um, Joy Mills, Living in Wisdom. It's a little bit of a commentary on the secret doctrine and Rada's Human Regeneration. So they are, um, you know, I'd be happy if there was only those books in my library. You know, I'd be happy because they are the real McCoy. So they're ones that I've found quite helpful. So I think that's probably all from me. I'm not sure how I've gone for time. Thank you, Renee. That was a, an amazing presentation. And um, certainly it makes us consider the practical side of theosophy, putting into action, going inward, so to speak, which I think is, for me, what theosophy is really all about. So spending the time to explore oneself through what we understand as our inner journey.